Our last speaker has enjoyed a wonderfully successful and diverse career to date. In the 80s, he worked closely with Richard Branson and was responsible for setting up a number of businesses with him, most notably Virgin Radio and Virgin Media. In the 90s, he started Ginger Media in partnership with Chris Evans, and in three short years, grew the business from nothing to a realized value of 225 million. Clearly not being satisfied with that, he set up an organization called Visit London, which quickly drove three quarters of a billion additional revenue into our capital city. Feeling now pretty invincible, we can only assume, in 2005, he took on a non-business that was known then as the Dome. It is now, of course, known as the O2, and David and his team have taken it from a national embarrassment to its current position as the world's most successful arena. The most amazing thing is that despite having achieved all of this, he's still one of the most modest people I know. Would you please extend a very warm welcome to David Campbell. Great. I'm going to get you as my front man for every other introduction. That's the, uh, that's the best one ever. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about AEG, just to explain who that is, um, the O2, what we've done then, uh, and then at the end, just a few thoughts about innovation, including a bit of psychology, which I'm absolutely uh, not at all qualified to talk about, at least the psychology part of it. But it's never stopped me before, and I won't stop now. Um, AEG, when I started there about six years ago, um, we used to get phone calls from people asking if we could fix their dishwasher and their microwave was broken and stuff like that. We don't do that. It actually stands for the uh, Anschutz Entertainment Group. It's an uh, American individual called Phil Anschutz who owns it. Uh, we touch about three billion customers every year, um, prestigious ven venues and premium markets. So the biggest owner of sports teams and events in the world, which I think is probably a good thing, with things like uh, the LA Lakers, Galaxy and Kings, uh, ice hockey team in Europe, in Berlin, in Hamburg, and the like. We're the second biggest concert promoter in the world. We're the biggest independent film producer in the world. We cover about 115 locations on five continents and about 20,000 employees. Um, if you look at our business very simplistically, um, we're all about, um, and I never ever use this with artists because they get very upset, especially somebody like Mr. Rose, uh, if I called them the content as software, but we're really about hardware and software. The buildings being the hardware and the content being the software. There's a few of the places that we, that we own and run on the left-hand side here. Times Square in New York, the Nokia Theatre, the Globe in Stockholm, Wukasong in Beijing, the O2, uh, Indigo also at O2, LA Galaxy's home, uh, Acer Arena in Sydney and so forth. Some of the artists and teams you'll recognise on the other side. Um, because most of the buildings are named, you probably haven't, as I said, heard of us, but actually if you look on the World League tables, you'll find that we own 20 of the top 66 venues around the world, uh, and we account for about 31% of all concert ticket sales. And right at the top of that, we've got the O2 in London. Um, as, as Simon said, I think I was probably feeling a bit punch drunk when somebody said, do you want to come and take on the Dome? And I guess having started in marketing, it's sort of um, every marketing person's dream and also worst thought um, to go and try and take this thing and turn it around. Um, and at the time, there were certainly sleepless nights when you'd wake up and think, what in the world have I done? Uh, I think one of the funniest things was people used to always say, you, you're quite smart and the company's quite smart. You must have done an enormous amount of research um, before you, you started this thing out. We did absolutely nothing at all. We spent 350 million pounds building what's inside of it. And the reason we did no, re no research at all is if you go on Google and put in white elephant and dome, and this was the scary bit, having accepted the job already, you get 650,000 hits coming back at you. So clearly it had a bit of a reputation. Okay, so I'll just move on and take you in a whistle-stop tour. I don't think I've actually been 15 minutes, but it seems that it's the first time ever I've done a presentation where everyone's been literally driven to drink during the middle of it. But first for everything, so there we go. go. If you jump inside it, it's actually a kilometre around the outside, um, 22 acres of tent, and just about 40% of it is the, uh, the O2 arena. There's about 7.5 million people a year go to the building, but only about a third of those people go into the arena. Uh, the rest of them go into the music clubs around the outside. There's 25 high-quality bars, restaurants, and cafes, 11 cinema screens with 2,700 2, seats, uh, an exhibition space that we've had things like Tutankhamun, we're bringing up Titanic soon, uh, and a flexible programming space called the, uh, the London Piazza. Um, it looks, if you haven't been there, um, 
I hope you have, but if you haven't, it looks a little bit like this inside, um, set up pretty much as it will be tonight for uh, Guns N' Roses in the top right-hand corner, Metallica down below, below uh, basketball there. One of the things that we do differently, and one of the things that's very important uh, in terms of monetizing the building, is to look at lots of different VIP areas and different experiences. So these are just some of the areas that you may have been fortunate to be taken to, uh, but, are, but are VIP areas. So Chairman's Club, which is down in the dressing room um, area, um, some suites up above, and VIP um, areas down below. And a very important revenue driver, and very important to look at this thing in terms of resetting the bar of how places are looked at. As I said, it's not just the arena. This is the uh, the music club outside of it, Indigo. You can see Jules Holin performing at the top. There's corporate dinners down below, uh, all kinds of performances. Very flexible space. Again, really, really important in terms of what you do. The um, the public areas here, out in the streets, um, we've got a festival in New Orleans. You can see uh, packed with people. And as I say, this gets two thirds of the amount of people. Um, that go, of the seven and a half million who go into the building. Movie premiere with High School Musical down in the, in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, and then the, the, um, the London Piazza space uh, with ice skating. Uh, one year we were silly enough to build a beach in it. And then the bottom right-hand corner, you've got the ATP World Tennis Finals, which comes up in November, uh, again into the O2. Again, really important when you've got a, got a big building like this. And the only way you get to the top of the world ranks is to go and create things. So with the ATP, we took the World uh, Tour Finals from Shanghai, brought it to London uh, for five years and created this amazing event that is uh, 15 different tennis matches or 15 de different tennis sessions uh, across, across eight days. And if you have a chance, uh, I think there's still a few tickets uh, left on some of the days. Uh, certainly try and go down there in November for that. Um, what's also interesting is we measure ourselves versus hotels. So I'm not really very interested how we perform um, versus some of the other people who do similar-ish things to us in the UK. I don't think they perform at a very high standard. So our measure is against four- and five-star European hotels. And you can see here on delighted, pleased, indifferent, and disappointed how we score. We're just doing marginally better. Uh, and what we're trying to do is move more of these bars to the left. So no point trying to get a disappointed person to be delighted. That's pretty challenging. But really important to try and take more of those pleased people and make them delighted. So move them one bar to the left in there. Now, all of that means that you get um, a lot of great corporate partners. So it's a great experience for people. Uh, and you, all of these names, I'm sure you'll recognize. Obviously, O2, but we also have big relationships uh, with all of these other people. The banking one actually is about to change in the beginning of the year to Barclays um, from that West RBS. Um, but the rest of those, as I say, you will, you will recognize. And they come there because you're taking their brand, you're borrowing their brand. I mean, people come and ask me if they can get a cheap deal on their mobile phone. I can't do a cheap deal on a mobile phone. Um, we're not O2. We just have the naming rights for O2. And we're a manifestation of the brand. And we provide benefits for their customers. Um, but it's really important we provide that at a very high level. I think the other things uh, to look at, which are in our business, which are quite important, are just the, the basic fundamentals. You have to be in the right place at the right time. Um, the bars on this graph are all about recorded music. So every, every aspect of recorded music, inclu including downloads, including everything else. Um, the graph going up behind it is live entertainment. Um, if you look at an artist's earning, you'll find in 2004, live revenues were about half of those in recorded music. By the time we'd got to 2008, um, live music was already outperforming recorded music. And that means that artists are making more money out of live performances than they make out of, re of recorded. Move up into 2009, you see pretty much the same uh, kind of thing happening. Um, live has grown by 9%, recorded is flat. And that's really, really important. I still have people who come to us and they go, we'll talk to the record company about whether the app wants to perform. I, 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 for some reason, Simon, all of us were saying we didn't get delegate lists. Everyone else got delegate lists, so I'll probably insult somebody from record company, so I apologize. But record companies aren't the driver of music um, these days. The live entertainment businesses, that's where the artists make most of their money. They'll make that decision, then they'll decide when to release a record, not the other way around. And I know if there's anyone from a record company, they'll come and tell me afterwards I'm wrong, or even worse, they'll go and talk to the president of the record company, and he'll call me up tomorrow and tell me I'm wrong, so I apologize for that. Um, just two more slides I want to, want to talk to you about, and then I will leave you to um, refill your wine glasses, which you've no doubt already emptied by now. Um, and that's just about what we remember. This is the psychology bit. I have no qualifications, but I will give you um, the footnote in a moment just to prove that it's absolutely real. If you look here, we remember about 10% of what we read. Um, if we look at something, we remember about 20% of it. If we hear something, we remember about 30% of it. 
If you see and hear something, you remember about 50% of it. But importantly, if you see, hear, and actually experience something, you remember 80% of it. So my experiential opportunity for a brand to get involved is going to be eight times as powerful as it's going to be for somebody going out and reading something. And that's the reason why we, we really focus on customers creating a great experience for them. It's why we sell more tickets than anyone else in the world. And it's also why we get some fantastic blue chip clients involved with us. And just to prove it, down at the bottom we've got William Glasser, psychiatrist, developer of retail theory and choice theory. So it's not me making that up. Um, so as I said, just two more slides here to go. Um, this next one I saw a couple of weeks ago and I thought it was a great slide um, and I couldn't really think when to use it and you are the unfortunate victims of being the next conference so I've nicked it and I thought I'd put it up here because it's good. Um, which is, this is low cost airline routes back in, in the year 2000. This is low cost airline routes in Europe in the year 2008. You can see it's changed quite a bit. So there's some real um, differences there in terms of people moving around. Um, look at another business, um, but the same kinds of numbers. Um, for a, a Formula One team, and somebody like Ferrari is spending, I think, about 150, 200 million uh, on their Formula One team. So it's about 50 million a car. Uh, but it's a very, very different game. 3.4 seconds was how long it took in the pit stop for Fernando Alonso in Monza um, to go through that. The 16 people, eight people in reserve, a pool of 30 who do it, they've practiced 1,300 times already, but it's also about physical innovation. They work on the nuts and the threads and the wheel optimization. It's probably too much detail for anybody who's, who's not interested in Formula One. And you, but you don't have to be a bit of a fan like me to understand that the 3.4 seconds is almost 10% better than the 3.7 seconds average they've had all year. And to shave 0.1 of a second off that, as they did in Canada, means that Fernando Alonso overtakes Lewis Hamilton in the pits and beats him in the race, which is you know, really, really important. That's the element of precision which changes every two weeks, really important. And the speed of innovation, I think, is absolutely critical. Um, there's, there's a thing you, you're probably all familiar with called Moore's Law, uh, and I did something along... <laughs> Uh, wait, <laughs> wait, <laughs> uh, which of course is the power of microchip, I think it's the power, of some again will correct me afterwards, the power of microchips will double every 18 months. There is, and, I'm, and honestly there is, a thing called Demi Moore's Law. Um, it's true. Um, and Demi Moore's Law, it's, it's actually really important, so please try and remember Demi Moore's Law. Uh, Demi Moore's Law basically says um, that the actual processing power isn't really that important. The bit that's really important on the technology side, the bit that's really important is the processing on the human side and the rate at which people adopt innovation. And so people pick up innovations half as fast as the actual technology can develop. And that's, of course, half as fast as Demi, and that's why it's called Demi Moore's Law. So you, people love great innovations, but they only embrace them um, when others have done it. And if you, you don't believe me, it's actually out of a Harvard textbook, which I can't claim to have read, called The Slow Pace of Fast Change. So it really is real. There's a couple of imitators, uh, a Gary Moore Law, which is about guitar sellers getting twice as fast every 18 months, um, and a Roger Moore Law, which is all about um, technology is much better if you're wearing a safari jacket. So... <laughs> Those, those two aren't, aren't true. Um, I actually learned about that at a, uh, another conference that I shouldn't have been invited to, which was a Deloitte uh, TMT technology uh, pre uh, predictions conference. Why I was there, I don't know, um, but I was, um, and I taught. And one of, the things I was, one of the things you have to do is try and predict what you think is going to happen next year. Um, and I, I talked a bit about 3D TV, which is a bit of a cheat, because we worked with Sky, and I knew a lot about what was going to happen. But the guy the year before, which is the important point, the guy the year before, at the beginning of 2009, had come and said, I think this 3D cinema stuff is, is nonsense, and it's never going to take off. Uh, of course, we also what happened with Avatar. Every movie out there now comes out in 3D. Um, they're going back and making things like Star Wars coming out in 3D. Sky, in the beginning of October, launched their 3D channel. If you go to the O2, you'll find a fantastic three-story Sky TV gallery, which has got just 3D TVs. The amazing experience. They've got one with a rugby ball in it being kicked at you, and everyone, everyone goes to grab the rugby ball as it get kicked, gets kicked out of the set at you. But the point is, that was 18 months ago when somebody was saying, it'll never take off in cinemas. It's now a TV channel channel being broadcast, you can go into any store and buy a 3D TV. So the, the pace of innovation really is quite fast. Um, actually looking at that, probably ending with a slide that says 3.4 seconds and Demi Moore in 3D is probably not the best way to end. So thank you very much.